This subject came about because we were talking about something as we did this morning, which was really about how we had a kind of idealized life here when the world was in turmoil outside of us, and that it would be interesting to talk about how our experience prepared or didn't prepare us for what was going to change imminently in the world around us. And then we realized that the moment in the chapel, um, in a funny way, was our own trigger. And as we were saying this morning, in a different time, that moment might have been perceived to be just a prank. Mm -hmm. And it would have been maybe a little bit funny, and it would have been harmless. But of course, times were changing, and those clouds were gathering, and there was no way to interpret it otherwise. <clears throat> and, and so that was about that part. And then we thought, there is, and I mentioned it last night for those of you who, who were at dinner, um, there's this thing about the unbelievable beauty of this place. You know, the power of this place, which has many ingredients, and what effect that had on all of us, and maybe particularly what effect it had on those of us who entered the creative world. And that you can define across the board. It's not just about visual art. Um, and so that's why we decided to do this, and I'm always happy to discuss this subject. And 20-some years at the Israel Museum, gave me a, a, a particularly privileged perspective on that subject, which, which I'll talk about. But it's funny that being in the chapel this morning, and we really, it was a wonderful conversation, and thank you Ward, for getting there and talking to us, uh, exactly from the same vantage point that you had when some of us left the chapel. Um, but the point that wasn't made this morning was to think about just the beauty of the place. You know, if I had been more sophisticated and more confident then, I might have protested leaving the chapel, and I might have protested this notion of abandoning required visits to that place just because of how uplifting it was for me <laughs> to go in there. You know, it's a synthesis of, it's a synthesis of so many aspects, so many disciplines in the creative world that manifest themselves in architecture. And you know, it's like going to the opera to be in that place. It was stunningly beautiful. It was visually stimulating. The music was extraordinary. The light was incredible. Frankly, I didn't care what they were talking about. For me, it was about absorbing that and how that gave me an ability to think about everything else that I did. And you know, going in there drew you in and coming out, exiting from the aisle. It's funny, I didn't walk out. I didn't walk out in deference to my mentor who was speaking. So I didn't walk out to Bill Howard, but you come out of there and the magnificence of what's in front of you. There's no way that that can't influence how your, your life evolves. And so for me, it's easy to talk to you about this notion of power of place and you don't think about these things at the beginning of your life, but partway through your life, you realize that you're on a relentless highway to something, right? You realize that, and you look back, and it all falls into place. Where you started, where you're from, how you looked at where you were from, how that affected how you moved forward, how coming to Mercersburg, for me, and this is a personal observation, how it changed my life to live in a place so beautiful at every moment that I thought about nothing else. I mean, I, when, when our class started to talk about this reunion and people were surfacing memories of things, I remembered none of those things. I think I had nothing to do with anything. I think I studied a lot and I absorbed how beautiful it was to be here every day. So in a way, that's what I'm gonna talk about. And I do have a bunch of images because, as I say, you don't realize at the beginning that you're on your own personal relentless highway, but midway through you figure it out, and then that continues to guide you as you go forward. And if you're lucky, it becomes a kind of privilege for your life experience. And I want to go through that, but then actually I want everyone else to talk. So I'm going to try to do that. Good. I'm going to try to do that. <laughs> 
Tina knows I'm no good at anything that requires, I cannot turn on the television. Okay. Some of you have been to the Israel Museum. It's not a secret that it's had an enormous impact on me. Um, the privilege of being there and doing what, what we were able to do there was really something extraordinary. And the museum turned 54 years ago, and a very important documentary filmmaker in Israel, um, who was actually the same age as the museum, so he was 50 that year, offered, said he wanted to do a documentary not about the museum, but where the museum was the backdrop of exploring the spirit of a cultural place to understand the cultural spirit of a nation using voices from within. And I just want to show you a little bit. He talked to many people. I'm not very much in it, which is a good thing. But I am a little bit, and it relates to the subject. So you're going to watch that. First, it's nice to have all of you here. I love having kids in the museum. Look, turn around. We're full of kids at the moment, which is a very nice thing. And how many of you have come before to the museum? I grew up in a little industrial river valley in rural Pennsylvania. If you were a boy, your goal was to be really big and to play football. I was neither really big nor could I play football. And I was a nerd. I was a nerd from birth. I'm still a nerd. <laughs> I'm sure I'm the only kid in our town that thought about how ugly our town was. <laughs> the only kid in our town that walked up the hill to have a broader view of the landscape and not just a view of the streets of our industrial town. My sisters and I were the only Jewish kids in our elementary school. I remember very distinctly carrying my paper bag with a piece of matzah wrapped in aluminum foil, wearing glasses, going to school. I was from another planet. And you know, when I came here, and everyone said, you're from another planet, I guess that's just the story. I was from another planet there. My parents never actually understood what I did. And then they did come once. Here. It was their first trip to Israel because Zionism wasn't really on the radar screen in our family and they came for our son's bar mitzvah and they saw the museum and they were taken by its breadth. And I think they also then really did understand what I do and they were, they were pleased. My town, where, where I grew up. Some of us are from the valley here. I won't ask you to raise your hands. So I was from Bell Vernon. And you know those signs they have all over Pennsylvania? There's one as you enter Versusburg, actually. And ours said, beautiful green. So Bell Vernon was neither beautiful nor green. <laughs> here is the streetscape of Broad Avenue in Bell Vernon. Neither beautiful nor green. Um, here, if you went up the hill behind our house, this is what you saw. Um, it's still industrial, but you have a sense of the broader landscape. And I carried that with me. And you know, we would go from our house every now and then, not very far away to Ohio Pile, to do the rapids on the Yakageni River, and we would see this place. You know this place, but you couldn't go there until you were 12 years old. <clears throat> Finally, when I was 12 years old, I would go to that place, and I didn't know about Frank Lloyd Wright, I didn't know about falling water, but I started to absorb this idea of site-setting landscape architecture. Now, I didn't define it in those terms when I was 12, I don't think, but I guess I understood that that's what, what, what it was going to be about. And the image of that place stayed with me all that time, and until I got here. And of course, then I got here, and these are just some vintage images of here. I don't need to show you this place in pictures because you all know it, and you know the magnificence of what we have around us. 
but this is just to remind you of how it was when we were here. And I have this picture of old 88 because it isn't here anymore. And who lived in 88? Two years. Subway City, basement of Europe. <laughs> but wait, speaking of the basement, so, you know, from the moment I got here, I started to think about these buildings, some of which were just Civil War, and, and some of which were still before the 20th century, and then they were always in the same style, with these field stone bases, you know, foundation walls made of stones from the landscape, and then Pennsylvania brick on the top. And then, of course, we know about site and setting, and we know about the relationship with the landscape. And I remember every year for each of those three years that I was here about the blooming of magnolias and lilacs. You can't forget that. And the relationship of those flowering trees <clears throat> to these field stone walls and these field stone bases that you would see everywhere. And I did know by the time I left that I was on that certain relentless highway where images like that were going to have meaning. And then I went off to MoMA after I came to New York to begin in the museum world. And you know, this was another kind of approach to the power of all those things. The smack in the middle of an urban setting was the old MoMA. It's not like this anymore. But in the old MoMA, there was this modesty of the international modernism of the street side. It was kind of anonymous. And you went inside, and, and, and in front of you, you had this amazing unfolding of the narrative of the birth of modernism. And then you had this garden on the back side. Where's that Andy Wolf? Andy Wolf, whose parents had this view from their apartment, 17 West 54th Street. And you know, this, and this was about landscape but in an urban setting. And somehow the power is that much greater when you concentrate it and when you condense it and when you're contrasting it with everything that's around it. So that was all the input that I had before we went off to Jerusalem. And some of you know the story that, that for us, we ended up there, not because we ever thought to go there. In fact, we never thought about it. And, and, and not because we even knew the Israel Museum, but the day that I was invited to go there, Within a day, I understood that we needed to be there because it was exactly about site setting, landscape, and architecture. And by then, I was sort of an art historian, and I knew that it was also about content. And in fact, it's really about content, and all the other things are context. But the Israel Museum became a kind of combination of all those things. What I'm showing you here is an image where on the top you see the initial drawings of the architect for the original museum architectural language, a guy named Al Mansfeld, who was born in Russia, trained in the Bauhaus, came to Palestine, and brought international modernism there. And his idea is on the top. It's like an Arab village on a Jerusalem hillside. And then he drew it, reinterpreting that village into international modernism that could grow as the village wanted to grow. And the museum on day one was like 50,000 feet. And when we arrived, it was 500,000 feet. So that village grew. And amazingly, what you see from the middle to the photograph on the bottom is that the original image, the original vision, is actually what was translated into architecture, which rarely happens. And that's the reality of the museum as it is today, which is simply the continuing unfolding of what you see on the bottom there. And if, if something is about site setting landscape architecture and a place which is about its content, which is about a cultural narrative that starts at the beginning of time and comes to the present, it doesn't need to look any more, look like anything other than what you see here. I'm showing you this daytime image and this nighttime image just because sight, being in Jerusalem, and this is an image that, that I would observe year after year, which is following the sunset on the summer solstice, the longest day of the year, when the sun drops behind the museum on the far side and you get this luminous quality of the architecture against that amazing night light. And you realize again the powerful intersection. It's like the perfect storm of all those things coming together to give you a sense of the power of a place. This is the whole campus of the museum. Uh, it's another talk to describe how this also is, is a, a kind of symbol of that incredible perfect storm of intersection 
of different aspects of modernist thinking from all over the world, but for the moment just absorb the grandness of the scale of it and the notion of this cultural place anchored to its landscape. Here, and I'm just going to go through some images so you have a sense that we're not just talking about site-setting landscape architecture, which is what makes, I think, this place powerful for us, but what happens on the inside. This is sort of the ascent to the Acropolis, again, with that amazing, uh, the luminosity of that nighttime view. <coughs> Here, the ascent to the Acropolis of the museum and seeing this reinterpretation of an Arab village on, this, on the crest of this hill into international modernism as the kind of neutral backdrop to tell a cultural story. Once you're inside the museum, it is a story that starts a million and a half years ago with prehistoric archaeology. That story starts on the left. To the center is Jewish world culture. To the right is the fine arts. Here are just a few images to give you a sense of how that narrative jumps in the same way that my experience at MoMA was all about understanding what happened in 1850 to enable the, 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 the birth of modernism, how an historical language could convert itself into an entirely new one. Here the story is about how the relentless march toward monotheism brings you to actually, this is the moment of those Canaanites, right before the idea of believing in one force instead of many, uh, came from Egypt to the ancient land of Israel and allowed monotheism to happen. Here, the beginning of a narrative of 2,000 years of Jewish world culture around the globe, mixing sacred and secular dimensions of that life, mixing Eastern and Western dimensions of that life. Here, a synagogue interior um, from Parimaribo, in Suriname being one of the oldest examples of that architectural language in the Americas, this from the 1850s. This the beginning of the narrative of the fine arts, beginning with art in Israel, because that's where we are at the museum, at a story that's only 110 years old, because that's when that story began. But then finding yourself surprisingly there in a set of galleries with modern art as strong as you find at the Museum of Modern Art. And to find it there in this broader context is something pretty extraordinary. What else happens there is the story then drifts across the continents from Asia coming in our direction to Oceania, then to Africa and ending in the Americas. And again, the startling idea that in this geographical setting, which is really far away from everywhere, but as I said last night, is in the center of the universe, to find a way to tell, tell a story that allows you to put everything in a context mm -hmm. and to anchor it in a landscape, and to anchor it in the bedrock of the landscape. Uh, this is the Shrine of the Book, designed by Frederick Kiesler, who was one of the great European modernists, who came to America, who was all about uh, the metaphorical meaning and the notion of abstraction, in, in architecture, and it's the setting for uh, preserving and displaying the Dead Sea Scrolls. Mm -hmm. And if you look closely, the, the dome of the shrine, which is the white building here, which is actually meant to look like the top of one of the pottery jars in which those Dead Sea Scrolls that were written 2,000 years ago were found in 1947, but the base of it is done with bedrock from where we are there. And it's a bedrock which, for a very long time, Palestinian masons have known how to take random stone and create random five-sided uh, drywall construction for foundation walls. And that's what Kiesler determined to use as the base for the Shrine of the Book. And you know, you wonder, why would he do such a thing? And what is it about that base? And of course, you're already thinking about 88 over here, where you have a field stone foundation wall with Pennsylvania brick on top, which anchors it to the landscape where it is. Beside that shrine of the book, we have this crazy uh, model of Second Temple Jerusalem, which is made of Jerusalem stone. It's a 50 to 1 scale. It's not archaeological. It is a symbol of, it's a cultural icon of its time because in the 1960s when Israeli architects couldn't go to the old city because it was in Jordan, from their memories they recreated that landscape. 
Now look at that landscape. When we brought it to the museum, we carved it into the bedrock. You see the bedrock right in the center of the image there. And in the surrounding walls, it just occurred to us to leave some of that bedrock and then put the foundation wall on top of it. So you couldn't miss this point, the point of this metaphor of being built of your bedrock. Actually, that's one of the things that really strikes you when you visit Jerusalem. So look at that image for a moment. We simply decided to do that. I mean, we could have sheared that wall and we could have had that random five-sided drywall come all the way down uh, to the base, but we didn't do it. And when we did that, I hadn't visited this particular section of the eastern wall of the old city of Jerusalem, where those Ottoman, when they were building this wall, built the wall of trim stone on top of that bedrock. Honestly, we weren't copying them. We thought of this all on our own, and yet there it was because they were, honestly, this is true, they were thinking presumably of the same thing, although it was easier for them not to try to shear the, the, the bedrock. But this is a powerful point. It's a very powerful point to think about what anchors you to a place and how that connects to the content that you draw from that place. And in my mind, maybe that is what if you back up on that relentless highway, maybe that's what was so powerful about the experience of being here for me, and I want everyone else to tell us how that relate, related to their experience. But just to, to conclude, as a kind of introduction, you know, this is what makes the power of that place. And honestly, it's totally a cultural place. And yet, it for me anyway, it was a kind of privilege to be involved in this setting when it could take on a certain role in cultural diplomacy, which is not about politics, but which is about the rest of the world. When I was at the Museum of Modern Art, which is just down the street from that Hilton Hotel where presidents would always visit, a president never visited the Museum of Modern Art. I got to Israel and Bill Clinton came and then George Bush came <laughs> and then Barack Obama came and after I was no longer director, Donald Trump came. <laughs> but maybe a high moment for me was when President Obama came on his first official visit uh, to Israel uh, to meet Bibi Netanyahu, the Prime Minister, you see they're not touching each other here, there's like <laughs> space between them. And he decided, he, we had two hours of a private visit in the Shrine of the Book looking at the Dead Sea Scrolls. It was an extraordinary, Tina <clears throat> will tell you I'm never moved by anything, but I was deeply moved by, hmm. by that. When he departed, we said goodbye in an official way. I'm about to show you an image that we don't release because you're not allowed to have that moment with the president. For me, this is like an unbelievable thing. This is something that will just always stay with me, especially as we get more and more into the times in which we live today. And look at that picture and the distance between the two heads of states and look at the serenity and perhaps appreciation on the face of the president of the United States and look at the consternation radiating from that image which was a moment later before those guys left. I'm only showing, this is not a political observation, I'm showing you these things because it's about what happens if you have an, a powerful intersection like this which grows out of those things of site setting, landscape architecture, and the narrative that you describe inside. For us, it extends, well, <laughs> the greatest thing, the greatest thing is that we were, we opened John Stewart's Daily Show that night. Really, no museum has ever done that. There we are looking at the great Isaiah scroll and, and John Stewart did an amazing thing with it that night. Where's John Stewart when we need him for president? Um, so that's that. But then culturally, this is the case as well. I won't dwell on this, but I hope all of you know who Ai Weiwei is. Um, Ai Weiwei is the Chinese dissident artist who really has rocketed to a certain prominence because he's known and recognized everywhere. And his focus at the moment is on the world refugee migration crisis, but his focus really fundamentally is on the condition of humankind. He would love to be at this school. Um, he has an 11 year old actually. Maybe we'll get his son here. But in any case, he is someone who might have hated Israel, 
because if you take the narrative of world refugee migration and you focus it on the challenge between Israel and the Palestinian Authority, he might have had that sentiment. Instead, he chose to visit the museum. Mm. At the end of his visit, this was his Instagram. Mm. At the time of his visit, he decided that he needed to love our museum and where we are in the world because mm. it's a place where you need to be compassionate about mm. the frailty of the life of people who live there, mm. regardless of whether they are Israeli or Palestinian, mm. whether they're Jewish, Christian, or Muslim. And we then did an amazing exhibition together a year and a half ago mm. that brought 600,000 people to the museum and left at the museum these two monumental mm. cast iron trees in front of our shrine of the book, which are so iconic for his work because they are about the resonance between people in China who believe that dead trees hold the spirits of their ancestors, mm -hmm. and the landscape in Israel, which is about olive trees, mm -hmm. which represent a kind of immortality. Mm -hmm. And so, again, it's about the power of a place like that. And finally, I just want to show you my favorite image of being at the Israel Museum for 20 years, which is when one of our school classes, which brings together uh, Christian and Muslim Arab kids with Jewish kids who are secular or, or from secular to very orthodox uh, for creative art classes together. And at their end of year graduation exhibition, these kids wanted to Instagram an image. And if you take the time to parse this image, you see kids from across that entire spectrum. And these are kids who, on an occasion like that, just want to take you and say how beautiful this place is. Because again, it's about that beauty. And it's about the beauty that we have here on this campus, and it's about the beauty that's in that chapel, which I think needs to continue to be promoted. And I don't know, when I think about, if I go in reverse on that highway, for me, my appreciation for this as the way to spend your life, and my appreciation for the power of this kind of experience as you're coming through your, the, the development of your own life experience just has a huge amount of meaning. Anyway, that's how I wanted to have a preamble, and I hope someone else is going to talk about their experience at this place now. Oh.